everybody. I'm Tanya Maddox and welcome to Montrose Matters Live. In the studio today, I have Caleb Valdez and he has no idea what he's in for, but we're <laughs> going to have a good time, Caleb. Don't you worry about that. So it is Friday morning and it is a good Friday. Welcome to spring. A couple of things that are coming up event-wise is today, uh, Grace Community Church is opening up their sanctuary from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m. for a journey to the cross. It is, um, you go through at your own pace and time if that is something you'd like to experience today on this Good Friday. And um, Easter, the Grace Community Church actually said they're doing the big Easter egg hunt again this year. But instead of a helicopter drop, this time they're gonna be just some great prizes in those eggs. So they're gonna be bicycles, um, Kindles, get air gift certificates, bowling gift certificates. So lots of fun prizes. So bring the kiddos out at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning and that'll be on the lawn at Grace Community Church. And then for all of those who want to continue to network, um, business leaders, Power Players Luncheon is happening at the Bridges on April 15th. Now, a couple of things that are happening in the future, but you want to go ahead and get on your calendar right now, is the FAB Women's Conference and Awards. The actual award nominations close on April 29th. The conference is on May 14th, and it's a full day of amazing women with a great speaker. The owner and founder of Lucky Dog Bark and Brews in North Carolina is coming out to tell us um, her secrets of success. Lastly, don't forget for all of you business owners out there, DMEA is giving away $30,000. Did you hear about that, Caleb? I did not hear about oh that. Oh my gosh, $30,000. So what DMEA has decided to do is their annual meeting is virtual again this year. So they're taking all the funds that they would put into food and so forth for the meeting and giving it back to the community. Okay. So they're giving okay. um, small business owners a portion of that $30,000. So all you have to do is apply. I'll apply. For sure. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. All right. So those are the upcoming events. Remember, if you have any events that you'd like us to air on Montrose Matters Live, just email us at hello at ourtownmatters.net. So I cannot wait to take uh, to talk to this rancher. Caleb is amazing and I've had fun this morning. We're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back with Caleb. Employees, uh, and we were in a double wide trailer with four exam rooms. Uh, so that's where we started behind an elementary school, uh, really focused on taking care of those children. It was a school-based clinic prior to us becoming an FQHC. Uh, but very quickly, we realized the community needed a lot more uh, support, a lot more access to healthcare. Uh, so in the last eight years, we've grown to, to three different sites. Uh, we have 104 employees now, uh, and we're taking care of about 6,600 unique patients a year. Do you imagine taking your business to the next level? You can stop imagining. We can help make it a reality. Helping businesses elevate their brand is our business. Contact Our Town Matters today for a free marketing evaluation and consultation. Call 970-765-0913 or visit OurTownMatters.net. So, um, okay, Caleb, I have a confession. And that confession is that River Valley's commercial is still playing, but we love River Valley. And so, um, you know what, I'm gonna start right there, Caleb. This show, we started three years ago, um, and it was just Montrose Matters, and it was in the um, Montrose Daily Press studio. And um, the only way that we could put on a show such as this is to have underwriters and sponsors. And so you are the very first episode where we were able to get sponsors and underwriters. So River Valley Family Health, thank you so much for sponsoring um, Montrose Matters Live. Elevate Fiber, thank you again for sponsoring Montrose Matters Live. They were one of our original sponsors when I started this three years ago. Mm -hmm. And then Our Town Matters, a little marketing firm that I happen to run, um, is sponsoring this. So I think it's because you're so popular. <laughs> I, I don't know about that, yeah. but, but I, I appreciate the flattery. Okay, well, yeah. you know. So Caleb, I had to, okay, I, I'm going to just confess. I had to look up the definition of a rancher. Like, okay. Yes. I. So tell me, what is a rancher? What do, What does your typical day look like? Um, well, I would say, you know, there is no typical day for sure. 
Um, but typically ranchers has to do with livestock. So when people say they're a farmer, you're talking more about crops. Um, ranching is usually livestock. Um, so for me, yeah, a typical day is just ensuring the cows are, are fed. And that okay. depends on the time of year. In winter, you be feeding hay. And in the summertime, making sure they have just pasture. So uh, putting them in new pastures. So And so um, it's, this is where my confusion um, lies. And I grew up in Texas, by the way, so okay. I should know yeah, these yeah. things. <laughs> but um, so when you own a farm and ranch, you are growing food, vegetable, or I guess you're growing food too. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. nurturing the food. But um, rancher is just livestock. And um, are you still a rancher if you don't process the livestock for food? Yeah, so most ranchers um, are not doing what I am as far as direct marketing. Okay. So typically a rancher is going to um, grow beef throughout the summer. Um, and then they will call weaning your calves. So those will be done in the fall. And then those calves will be sold at a local like sale barn or online auction. Ah, I see. And then those go into what's called the feedlot. Um, and then eventually are harvested by large packing plants. Um, so I'm a rancher who's trying to take them from start to finish. So being able to go directly farm to table, ranch to table, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So, so let's talk about that. Um, let's back up and talk about your background. And uh, I told Caleb he was told he was just in for it today. My understanding is your um, undergrad degree has nothing to do with yeah. farming or ranching. Yeah. Most it's it's pretty much like everybody in society, right? You don't yeah. have you you study something, you go a different direction. Um, but for me, yeah, I I studied philosophy um, and forestry. So did you hear that? He studied philosophy in forestry, yeah. <laughs> and now you're a rancher. Yeah, well, I always tell people it's because uh, I wanted to think deeply in the woods. So it <laughs> I was love just, it. It was purely forestry was for, for uh, working for the Forest Service, and then philosophy is just a personal interest. So tell us about that. You, um, so out of school, you started working for the Forest Service, and you just weren't fulfilled there. You yeah, I mean, move on. Uh, yeah, I think... Um, I think it's a great job, great opportunity. You got to see cool places, work in incredible mountains, fight fire. Um, definitely um, great opportunity. I just, I think I would consider myself an entrepreneur. So it's nice to just make decisions um, when you're working for a big business or a big bureaucracy. Right. As everybody knows, there's lots of red tape. So, so all right, Caleb, you're an entrepreneur. And your vision for Uncompagre Farms is what? Um, well, for, for right now, um, it's just getting developed um, and just getting started. And so I tell people it's a self-led internship that I'm on. <laughs> so um, I'm just trying to figure out more about land management, animal husbandry, and then just the business marketing side of things. Okay. I think if I was going to say large scale, it'd be to have more of a cooperative to where you could have other ranchers and farmers um, come under that umbrella to sell beef locally. Um, because I'm probably never going to be able to raise enough enough beef. But if you had other ranchers that sold it instead of a commodity to you know the sales yards, how I told you earlier, in feedlots, but sold it directly to their community. Okay. Um, but you got to build that platform. So I got to be able to show them that I could sell that product. Yeah. Well, and you've been extremely successful. It's two years into it, right, for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so. Um, I mean, did you just go out and buy a ranch? I mean, what did you do? How did, how is Uncompagre Farms fulfilling these orders that we see happening online? Uh, well, I, I wish I could have bought a ranch, did you? Um, but I did not. And so uh, working for the Forest Service, I went to California and fought fire. The only way I knew how to make money was lots of overtime. <laughs> and so I told people I um, could buy cows, but I couldn't buy a ranch. Um, and so once I knew I had some money, I just would travel around our valley here and knock on doors, cold call and say, uh, you know, what's going on with this piece of property? Are you interested in leasing it? Um, so I didn't even have cows. I was just trying to find the land first. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, so eventually um, getting some landowners to be like, OK, yeah, you can put some animals out here. Um, and once I got that, then I, I would just buy cows um, and slowly grow. And so um, now, you know, have a couple thousand acres leased and just just going for it really uh, so wait you have a couple of thousand acres leased right now and they're all over the region here or are they all in montrose uh yeah so there's some in the montrose valley okay. um that would be considered more your fall and winter grazing um and then uh, you also harvest hay off of that property 
and then a new lease that I'll be taking cows up on Uncompahgre Plateau okay. on a larger property uh, this summer. So. All right. Yeah. So, um, and those, how many cows do you have right now? Um, well, one of the things that I can give you a hard time about is if you ask a rancher how <laughs> is many... Is that even allowed yeah, to it, give me a yeah, hard time? Yeah. So if you, if you ask a rancher uh, how many cows they have, it's like asking somebody how much money do you have in your oh. account. <laughs> So, uh, but I have 50, so 50 cows. <laughs> but just, just a future lesson to, okay, you know, if you I, run into a rancher, you might not want to ask him that. Do you want to know how much money I have? No, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Then we can just call it even. I had no idea. Yeah. Okay. So is it because people um, can just calculate the value of a cow when they Yeah, make it? it's just one of those things, tradition, I guess. Or a farmer, you, you don't say how many acres you farm. Um, you kind of le leave that up to them to give that information. You know, I don't mind being, you know, just taught a lesson or two on yeah. this show. I love it. When can I come out to your farm? Anytime. Really? Um, can I bring the camera crew? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that is one of the other things that I'm trying to do is the transparency. Oh, okay. Right? So um, see where the animals are. I had a small get together recently um, and just let people see what I'm doing, right? right. Because. Um, at the grocery store, you don't know the story of what you're buying. I mean, there's some great marketing, great packaging, yeah. um, but if you actually come out there and be like, oh, this is this is how it's raised, you know? Right. No, I'm looking forward to that. Um, just don't scare me with any grocery story, you know, store <laughs> stories about what I'm buying. Listen, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about why Caleb chose um, Montrose to start his business and just his true love for um, educating people about food. So in the uh, studio today, we have Caleb Valdez and he is just educating me. And I hope you guys are having fun. We'll be right back. Gigfoot Zero Lag Gaming does exist. The real myth now? Slow internet made you lose. So step up your game with Elevate Internet today. Ooh, that steak was good. Okay, I'm kidding. I didn't have <laughs> I was, you know, you didn't bring anything for me. You're right, I failed. The, and the crew that. was hungry, you know? <laughs> I mean, we wanted to try something. For, I guess we're going to have to buy something. You are an entrepreneur, right? Right, so I'm taking my first lesson right now. Make sure you buy it, just don't give it to you. Oh, okay, darn, darn. So, listen, this comes, um, you have a true love for food and educating people on what they're putting in their bodies. Um, tell me more about that. Yeah, I think um, for me, one of the things that uh, I want to know is the where it comes from right the transparency so if you've ever had a garden or grown something there's just it's just something that tastes different because i think you you know what it took to grow that mm -hmm. and so um of course not everyone's going to be a rancher not everyone can raise beef um but that's you can find people who appreciate that and they, they see it as a craft unlike um folks who just want to eat a burger because it tastes good you right know? i mean i love burgers they taste great um, but where do you go a, to eat though? Yeah. Where do you buy a burger? Well, you know, I, I, um, I'm, I'm trying now to just cook what I, what I grow. Oh, okay. Um, but I, yeah, I'll, I'll eat a crash burger. You know, I'm, I'm not one of those who, uh, you know, sacred cow thing. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll eat. It's just, there is something to be said about when you grow your food, mm -hmm. you know. And when you know where it comes from. And yeah. that's, you know, um, right now, if I went to grocery store B, just gonna mm -hmm. call it. And um, I saw some great fillets on sale, and I say, oh, I'm gonna cook those. Yeah. Which everyone knows I don't do the cooking in my home, Travis does. <laughs> so, um, but there is no way for me to trace where that beef actually came from and when it was processed and that whole process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there was a time in which you had a local butcher um, and lots of farms provided that mm -hmm. local butcher, but now, you know, large grocery stores 
Um, one of the things I think is really misleading is you'll see oftentimes it says product of USA. Um, that doesn't mean it was grown in the USA. It means it was processed here. Oh, interesting. And so lots of beef that, com that we consume in this country are, are imported from other uh, South America, Australia, New Zealand are some of the largest imports. Um, and so it says product of USA, but it was never grown here. It was just butchered here. Okay. See, again, you're educating us. Um, you know, Caleb, you are, you're probably going to have one of the highest ratings um, for Montrose Matters because you are the epitome of what Montrose was founded on, you know, ag and yeah. so forth. And you're not from here. Like, you chose to start this business here. Why? Yeah. Um, well, first I came here for the Forest Service um, and ended up loving the, the community. So I grew up um, south of here at Cortez. Somewhat similar agriculture, um, but you can't, the, the views here are, are incredible and the mountains here are incredible. Um, so yeah, I just love the outdoors. I'm a pretty outdoorsy person, okay. skiing, biking. Um, so that was really why I love this area. But then, yeah, as I started just thinking about this agriculture and doing direct marketing of beef, you know, we have, if you go any direction, you're going to see cows in Montrose, right. right? And so, yeah, it's just, it's an agriculture community, mm -hmm. um, like you said. So I think I just, if I could find the land, I would love to, I wanted to stay here. And so that was the hurdle was like, I got to find some land to lease. You know, and I'm just wondering how many other future ranchers are out there who are, you know, that you are inspiring them that this can be done. You're taking baby steps to do yeah. it, and it sounds like you're doing it the smart way. Um, so what advice would you give young ranchers? Well, I think, I think um, <clears throat> the hardest thing is just going out and, and doing it, trying something, right? That was, I had these ideas for a long time, but just taking the step. And, and going out. And one of the encouraging things I'd say to new uh, ranchers would be, it's typically an older uh, demographic mm -hmm. in farming and ranching. And so these folks, it's backbreaking labor, they won't be able to do it forever. And a lot of these folks have invested their whole lives into it. They don't want to necessarily sell the land to have it developed. They want to see it continue to be in ag. And so um, if you can make connections with these, this, this generation, you know, the baby boomers, people who are getting out of it to, in, entrust you to take care of their property Interesting. you know so that's what I'm finding okay. um, is that you know it's a lot of people that just physically can't do anything with the land and they're just they're happy to see a young person that's interested in what they spent their whole life doing right so I think that's encouraging if you're new yeah so you know you bring up a very uh, valid point here and we're gonna uh, I'm gonna take a question but I want to know <sighs> Um, you're a first generation rancher. How many of you guys exist? <laughs> uh, very few. Um, that's for sure. Typically when you hear people, they'll talk about, you know, I'm third, fourth, even fifth generation rancher. Um, and th their family's been on that land forever. And so, yeah, me, I'm on, I'm on other people's land. <laughs> I, I don't own any of it. Thankfully I grew up around it. So, um, you know, have a comfort with animals, horses and cows, which can be intimidating if you're an adult, you've never been around them, but as a kid. I'm not intimidated at all. <laughs> so yeah, so for me, um, yeah, first generation, and yeah, I, I think I do take pride in that because um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have any land given yeah. to me. Gosh, you know what I, um, I love about you? Your simple humility, but the strength behind that. You're going to uh, create something great. What I, um, question that did come in, and thank you guys. Go ahead and send any questions. But um, you have an interesting um, approach on restorative land and ranching. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, there's, there's a bigger movement now called regenerative agriculture. Um, they don't like to call it sustainable because what we are doing isn't sustainable. Uh -huh. So regenerative is uh, how do you improve that landscape? And it's really just working with, with nature, not against it. So okay. um, it's utilizing, you know, as uh, uh, the cowness of the cow. So um, <laughs> wait, wait, can I see utilizing the cowness of the cow? Yeah, so I saw that from Joel Salatin. He's kind of, uh, if you will, the godfather of this regenerative ag. Okay. Um, and he, he talks about that a lot. And so you know, we have confined cattle with our fences, with our feedlots, um, and the joke is, you know, grass is always greener on the other side. Well, that's what cattle do. They constantly move, they take a bite, mm. and they move. They just want to travel. You know, buffalo, herbivores, that's what they want. And so we're the ones who block them with our fences. And so what we're trying to do is mimic nature with electric fence. And so you stop them um, 
with electric and then you consistently move that fence to give them new pasture. And the reason that you do that is uh, you keep the herd close, which would normally be done by predators. That's why you have herds. Right. Um, and so the electric fence, when you keep them tight, you get a better distribution of fertilization. Um, you get um, hoof action, which is like on your yard, you know, when you aerate it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's just trying to mimic nature with an electric fence. Instead of putting a huge bob wire fence and letting the cows do whatever they want, you're trying to keep them tight, but always moving. And it keeps the cows healthier too because um, they're not staying in their, their feces. So right? does it keep the um, predators away as well? No, it doesn't keep the predators away, but I mean, here in the valley, like predators aren't really an issue. Um, so okay. it's just trying to mimic what predators would do if um, they were out in nature. Good. So um, let's talk about packaging because you got some pretty awesome packaging and I learned something again today. Um, you don't process and package anything. No, no. So um, all meat that you consume in this country has to be um, processed through what's called a USDA facility. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily here in Montrose, we have one, Kinnikin Processing. And so um, when the animal is slaughtered on site, there is a government inspection that makes sure that it's done properly. Um, and then so that meat is then um, processed through them. It's my meat's dry aged, so it's hung for 21 days, oh. um, which creates more tenderness um, and breaks down those en enzymes. So that's why it's more tender. Right. Uh, but you get less meat because it's shrinking due to the air. Whereas most meat, like at the uh, grocery store, is called wet aged, and that once it's processed, they're basically packaging it quickly to ensure they have more meat. Okay. So the, the dry aging at Kennekin, I can do that here. Um, which is great because it just, I think, has a better product and they, they process it and once it's done, I'll pick it up after 21 days. Oh, that's amazing. And so when you say you um, pick it up, because I was looking at your website and um, remind me of that web address again. Uh, so it's unco, U-N-C-O, farms.com. Unco farms.com. I was looking at your website and um, you sell all parts of the cow. So when you, do you tell Kinnikin how you want it cut and processed be based on what people are purchasing from you? Absolutely. So trying to learn more what consumers want and I can, you know, have them turn it all into burger if I wanted. Okay. Um, but you're only going to get a certain amount of steaks. So typically on a, on a beef, you're getting 20% of those steaks. And so what I'm trying to do, because I don't have enough cattle, is sell uh, the percentage of meat you typically get off a cow. So say 20% would be steaks, 50% would be ground, and the rest are like your roast or stew meat and things okay. like that. So I can't just uh, have an a la carte where I sell you just T-bones or ribeyes. Um, so I'm trying to bundle the meat, so it'd be like 10, 20, 30 pounds, and then you're getting a percentage of meat that you typically get off a, a cow when it's butchered. Okay, so I know everyone wants to know this question. What's your favorite part? of the cow what's oh, your favorite man. meat well there's um there's and is there only one do you have more than one <laughs> yeah yeah right that's that'd be it's, it's difficult i think one steak that people don't know about as much is called a flat iron oh. um like people know about the ribeyes and stuff mm -hmm. but a flat iron steak if you can remember that and find one which you probably won't at the grocery store <laughs> Um, but I, I know where you can find some. Really? Um, so those, <laughs> like that's a, that's a really cool uh, cut and, and good steak. But I mean, the ground beef is like universally, you can do so much with it. You okay. know, if you want to cook a burger or whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, you always gotta have ground beef. <laughs> ground beef, all right. But yeah. I'm gonna try this flat iron. So where can we find this? Is the only way to um, get your steaks is online? Uh, so right now, yeah. Um, this summer, though, I will be going to some farmers markets. Okay. Um, so early on, I couldn't I couldn't sign up because I didn't have any product to sell. Right. Um, and so now that I have uh, beef, they'll be ready to be harvested each month. Um, I'm going to start going to um, the farmers markets here in Montrose Ridgeway, and I might be going up to Mountain Village. Um, oh, good. And selling some some beef up there. So. Okay. But anyone can um, call you to. Oh, and yeah. Just... Yeah, that's, I mean, that's also like the transparency. Like, how many times can you call somebody who grew your food you know, your <laughs> beef, and be like, hey, I want this cut or whatever? And so, yeah, very accommodating. Like, it's, it's not always the, the uh, best transaction. You know, I'm out there with a piece of paper, as, as your studio knows, your help <laughs> here. Um, but, but it's real. You know, it's, 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 I tried uh, to call the manufacturer of Doritos, and they just wouldn't answer yeah, the call. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, 
So that's, that is the case. Like I'll just, friends or family, whatever, be like, I want a roaster. And I can, you know, Venmo, PayPal or whatever, you know, take a card. So, okay. um, but it, I'm just, I'm learning too. You know, that's one of the things of the business and marketing is like, how do you get the product to somebody? Um, one of the things I just did is, it's called a Big Cimarron box. And so uh, I'll just deliver that for $10 in the Montrose community. So if you're on the website and you put in a zip code, it will know that you're a local drop off. Really? And so you can just order, there's a very few items on the a la carte mm -hmm. that I have excess of. And so you could pick those up. Um, and then drop them off for just a, a fee. So, so you also have um, an event idea in, in our last few minutes. Tell yeah. me about that. Well, I've just, you know, I've been thinking, kicking around it. If I could hold some events to where, you know, people can come see the cows, maybe you could get some music um, and just be outside. Another thing with COVID, you know, it, it could be an outdoor event. Um, have, have just people getting together um, and whether you're giving away some food, um, maybe getting a local brewery or something together, but trying to pull pull the community back to to, to the land, right, right. And to the animals. So and a so, farm to table yeah. type of vibe yeah, exactly. with some food, or with some uh, obviously we'll have food, but yeah. with music and yeah. just community involved. Yeah, like a farm yeah. to table event is what I was wanting to do, and I was talking to some folks about that. Um, and then all of all of this COVID happened, and so hopefully this summer or later fall we can revisit that and, and maybe do some events. Well, I'm sure after this show you're going to have plenty of people who are interested in partnering with you on something like that. And I do know this great little event firm too that would happily take that on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Caleb, I promised you you would have fun on the show. Have you had a good time? Oh, it's been great. Yeah, yeah you're a great host. Thanks. Well, you're very welcome. Anything else you want to say out there to Montrose? Uh. Well, I, I just think that, um, you know, we do have, like, as you said, a great agriculture community. Um, and it's not about buying meat for me. There's a lot of people who sell beef locally. And so I think my message would be, you know, find somebody who, who does raise it and buy it from them. Um, there's a lot of money in these grocery stores distributions. And all small producers like myself are the one who's raising it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a handful of us that want to make sure it goes from our farm to your table. And so find, find those people, you know, buy it from them. That's great. You know, um, Caleb, my message to the community is think big and think beyond what you see in front of you just like you did. Thank you so much for what you've been doing um, for this community and what we know you'll continue to do in the future. And that's a wrap, everybody. We hope you join in next week when we have Eric and Beth Feely from The Bridges.